Hi, everybody. My name is Jared Milrad. I'm the founder of Movie Karma. We're the nonprofit organization based here in Los Angeles that created our podcast uh, here called Rewriting Hollywood, which I'm sure, as many of you know, focuses on diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as representation and social impact in Hollywood and the entertainment industry at large. Uh, today, really excited to have a special guest who is now Oscar nominated uh, for her incredible work in the film King Richard, which I'm sure many of you have seen. If you haven't, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, her name is Anjanu Ellis, uh, Oscar nominated for Best Supporting Actress uh, in, in the film King Richard, uh, where she did incredible work uh, playing Miss Orsine Price, uh, who uh, is perhaps best known for being the mother of Serena and Venus Williams, who are obviously legends in their own right. Um, so really excited to have Anjanu on the podcast today to talk about her work in the film and beyond. Uh, Anjanu, thank you so much for joining us. Excited to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we'd love to start off, Anjanu, just getting a sense of your background. Um, we saw that you were born, I believe, in San Francisco and spent your childhood in part on your grandmother's farm in Magnolia, Mississippi, and then went on to college, transferred to Brown. Um, you earned a Bachelor of Arts in African American Studies uh, and went on to a graduate program at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. Can you tell us a little bit, Anjanu, about some of those earlier days and when you decided that acting might be your, your path? Um, yeah, so I went to Mississippi when I was three years old. Um, my mother, my grandmother, um, my grandmother raised me um, for the earlier part of my life. My mama came in a little later. Um, but yeah, I went to, went to, went to college at the school, HBCU school in central Mississippi called Tugulu College. And I had absolutely no designs, no dreams of being an actor. I was dramatic <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, probably needed that, uh, you know, uh, something to, to, to use all that dramatic energy. I'm sure my cousins and everybody else would tell you that I was dramatic, <laughs> but um, I, didn't, I didn't have any designs on being, being an actor, um, but, uh, someone else um, saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, which I think is so, so beautiful and profound. And I encourage that in other people to be that for somebody else. Um, anyway, this person, his name is Jim Barnhill. He lived to be 99 years old. Um, he encouraged me to go down another path, go down this acting path. And I didn't buy it, I didn't believe in it, but I was doing everything I could to stave off unemployment. And I felt that, okay, you want me to stay in school? I'll do that, sir. There you go. <laughs> I'll do that, sir. Um, if I had had to, you know, go to New York and, you know, do what so many brave, wonderful actors do, which is go to New York or go to Los Angeles or wherever, and you know, get on the trail of just auditioning raw dog. You know what I mean? I I would not have done that. There's no way I would have done that. So yeah, I mean, um, and then I went to NYU, and before I graduated from NYU, I I had a job, so that helped me sort of not have to graduate from school and then go to on auditions. You know, um, yeah. I think because I had that really sort of back-to-back -back early success, it kept me doing doing it. You know what I mean? Because if I had to do it without those sort of, you know, you know, little moments of of you know me not having to decide for myself that I could do this, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have continued continued in it. Mm, that's really interesting. So. It sounds like though you had at least one mentor who encouraged you, yeah. supported you. What were some of the things that he said or others said to you that would that really helped you, other than what you mentioned, that really sort of helped you or guided you in those tough times? Yeah, well, I also I also Mr. Mr. his name is Mr. Barnhill. 
I call him that. Um, but he he really didn't say he was very he was he was a man of, you know, he wasn't the most um, you know, uh elegant, you know, in terms of like the things that he would say to me. He was like, this is what you need to do. Do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It yeah. wasn't like this uh, encouraging, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, um, these encouraging words. He, he just said, you need to do this. I want you to do this. And, you know, that coupled with my fear of what it would be like if I didn't, I was like, okay, all right, I'll do that. But what I did have before Mr. Barnhill is I had a woman in my life, two women in my life. One was Geneva Patterson, who was my elementary school librarian, and she would help me do speeches and that kind of thing. And then I had someone in my life, her name was, was Mrs. Turner. And Mrs. Turner, took myself and a whole bunch of kids from South from South Mississippi and put us in a station wagon. There was a thing called station wagons and drove us in this big old station wagon. We was a caravan, drove us to New York City when I was in, I was, I probably was 18 or 19. And my first play that I saw to see, she took us on this trip to see theater because we ain't never seen no professional theater because ain't no professional, you know what I'm saying? We just yeah. didn't have access to those things. This was wild to us. Yeah. We heard about it. Right. <laughs> never experienced it, you know? Mm -hmm. And she she knew that, that that lack was in our life and she wanted to create cor correct that. So she put us all country, all us country folks, country kids in a car, took us to New York, we saw Fences. That was my first play I've ever seen in my life. It was a Broadway play outside of Christmas, you know, Christmas plays at church. It was my first professional play. Um, and it starred Courtney B. Vance. And, you know, years later, I ended up being Courtney B. Vance's wife right. a couple of times. Right. right. That's amazing. You know, so yes, she she certainly wasn't like you should be an act, but she wanted us to see something that we that was that we would never have seen otherwise. So these sort of that these sort of that kind of seed planting was done by these people in my life. Mm, kind of extend the horizon of what you thought maybe was possible. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I read that you went, uh, interestingly, you went home um, on Genoa after you, you were attending NYU and then you moved back to Mississippi to be with your family. Um, and that things you said came into clear focus during that time for you. I was wondering if you could talk more about that. And because I feel like, um, sometimes that that type of move is looked askew or you know f folks are like why are you why are you doing that are you leaving mm. your, your career your dreams behind to be with your family and, and seen as a trade-off I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that yeah you know I didn't I I, I like I said I didn't have I, my origin story is not I've wanted to be an actor all my life do you know what I mean and I had this mm. I had this sort of early I call it success but it really was I would just call it employment. You know, it was shiny employment, but really was employment because what was most important to me was to be able to be employed because I didn't have anybody else who would have, no, I have anybody to fall back on. Right. You know what I mean? Um, but so, so I was working and, and, and a little bit here, had done a little theater here, some, some movies you know, nothing that really saw the light of day. Do you know what I mean? And I was doing that and not believing in this profession that I had. I wasn't believing in it. I didn't think that my feeling was that if this, I don't want to, can I? No, curse? you can't. You can't podcast. Okay. Yeah. I, I was like, if this shit don't work out, I need to get a, you know, I need yeah. to get put an application somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. that was always always a possibility for me and then I just I you know the work was continual it was it certainly wasn't you know it wasn't anything that anybody really was paying attention to but it, it continued you know it didn't necessarily dry up a whole lot mm -hmm. and then um I was in New York and it, it just wasn't something that was important to me personally important to me 
Mm. You know, it wasn't in my vision. It wasn't a part of my vision and I didn't have one. Mm. You know, and it, it, it's tough being a kind of a grown ass woman and not really having that. And then um, my, then I had a family member who got ill mm. and I had to go home back to Mississippi because I had to take care of them. That person couldn't live by themselves anymore. And so everything came into laser focus because I had to do everything I can, first of all, to keep this person alive. So my jobs mattered. <laughs> Right. <laughs> they mattered, you know, so I, I would get these auditions and I would not accept no for an answer. You know, I would get like, oh, we don't know. We're going to give it to, you know, name mm -hmm. is 10 women. We're going to give it to this person that let them go down the list. But mm -hmm. all along, I, I was sending in tapes. Then I started stalking people. Where are they shooting? Oh, they're shooting here. Okay, I'm gonna drive over there mm. and see if I can meet with the director. I was doing that kind of stuff. There was one time that I flew. I was I was shooting something in Croatia, and I flew on my day off from Croatia to Los Angeles and back again wow. because I wanted this. I was doing stuff like that. It just I was just I started fighting. I guess that's what it was because I needed to fight for the life of this person that I was taking care of. And then on top of that, I was back in Mississippi among the Confederates, right? The ones that don't hide about being Confederates, um, you know, driving by Confederate flags every day. Mm -hmm. And so I was battling Confederates, literally because I was fighting to get the Confederate flag taken off the Mississippi state flag that became a part of my, what I wouldn't, if I wasn't doing that, that's what I was doing. And then I was fighting for this family member's life. And I think that because I was embattled, that acting became something I could use as, a, as towards the purpose. And my purpose was those battles. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. That's really interesting that during that time, as you said, you're in battle in all these different ways that that, gave, that acting, yeah, fulfilled, kind of gave you a sense of, 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 as you said earlier, like vision and purpose. Yes. Is, is that something, Anjani, that you feel like, you know, if there are young actors or young creators listening to this that early on in their careers, like having that, having that fierceness almost, that, that fight, like, is that yeah. something that you, you, people can cultivate you think or should cultivate or was it just something that you feel like you you kind of ran into and it and it developed from there I think it was if I'm going to be honest I think it was something that 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 was the happenstance of my life at that moment and um and 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 here's here's also what I think is also important to me acting my my acting was never the most important thing to me and it, it's never it's never been the most important thing to me. My family has always been the most important thing to me. So everything that every, everything was in service of of taking care of my family, you know. Um, and then all these things started started to converge, um, and it didn't feel so separate, you know. It didn't feel like oh I'm I'm acting and then I'm doing this. Like all of it became. Um, something that was that that was holistic, you mm. know. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Kind of unified. Uh, mm. Yeah, interesting. And, and so obviously you've been out, you've been at it for a while since that. Yes. Point. You've been at it for several decades. You've done some incredible work um, in you know Ava DuVernay's project and when they see us, you you've done incredible work in, in film, TV. Um, I'm curious, um, moving to this, this, this project, King Richard, um, you, you face, you've talked a lot about facing the challenge of playing a real person, um, Miss Orson Price, mm -hmm. but also that you didn't want to do kind of a, a, a reenactment, um, a documentary reenactment, I think you refer to it as that you really wanted to create this, this person. And I understand you listened to tapes that she had shared in an interview, um, I think the writers and the creators of the film. Yeah. Um, but talk a little about that. Like, what was that process like as first as you came to have this role and think about, okay, I, I want to portray this person fairly and accurately, but I don't want to just reenact 
um, you know, who they are, who they were maybe in real life. What was that balance like for you? Well, Miss, you know, sometimes in, in, in creating characters and I, I love doing that. I love creating characters and, you know, for, I think I've been described as a character, I've been described as a character, as a character actor by somebody. That's not how I think of myself, but, you know, I'm like, yeah, I like that. And then coincidentally, I'm like, okay, well, you're right. I do. I like creating characters. You know, I, I, I like that. And if you're somebody who likes creating characters rather than being another iteration of yourself, you know, the, the, you start by, you start by these sort that this, that work that you do, that's on the exterior, you know, you like how someone talks, how they hold their mouth when they talk their hair, how they wear their hair, what's the, how their, their voices sound. And I love doing stuff like that. And I had just recently played a character like that before you know, we started uh, King Richard. Um, but Miss Orsine does not have those sort of just um, those superficial things that you can kind of grab to character-wise, exterior stuff. You know, she's, she, her, her voice, um, and the way she speaks is very um, Midwestern, middle of the road. She has Southern roots, but she's not Southern. Right. It's different. She has origins, but she has an or Southern origins, but she's not Southern. So what would happen is I would, because I'm mis from Mississippi, I would bring that to it. And Isha Price, her daughter, was on set every day, keeping us, you know, keeping us on the right path. Mm -hmm. And she would send messages to me like, "My mama does not talk like that." <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's the pressure though. She's like sitting right there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you know. Thank God she was though. Mm -hmm. It helped me. It helped me be, be specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with what with, with with what I was doing, and and I it, it that 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 ostensibly doesn't look like character work, but it absolutely is. It doesn't look like that on on the surface because it's not like you're really doing anything that can be den I really identified as behavior that's too different from who you are. Mm -hmm. Not it's not readily viewed that way, but because she was not southern, I am southern. Because she is a very poised, very held, very contained woman, I am not a very poised or withheld or contained woman. Mm -hmm. You know, that was that was an that was a character, that was character work. It was character work. And I and I loved it. I looked at some of this because I'm just now seeing some of the scenes because I haven't seen the full movie, but I'm just now seeing some of the scenes and I'm seeing, I'm like, yeah, that's not how I would do that. If I were in that situation with my husband, it would it would have gone down a whole different mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. But that's how Miss Orsine, that's what Miss Orsine, how Miss Orsine did it. Yeah, and we'll get to that. I want to talk about some of that in a minute. I see you know, the famous kitchen. Now, now in this kitchen scene and some of the other parts of the film that have become kind of in their own right uh, moments um, that, that I think have broader resonance for people. But you also said, uh, have said, uh, Anjani, that you're, quote, um, that you're, quote, talking for Miss Orsine in a way that you felt this sort of sense of responsibility, um, in part because, as you said, a, a lot of stories are told about us, um, about folks of color about black women but not by us mm -hmm. um yeah. uh, which being an lgbtq community i i you know i think a lot of us who are in any underrepresented community that that rings in our ears right and it's like hey we want to tell our own stories yes. um could you talk a little about that like why that was so important in moving with this particular story yeah and i'm glad you i'm glad you i mean that's that is drives me effing crazy mm -hmm. I, I don't, <laughs> it makes me insane you know, and I and I and when I found out that Miss Orsine was, you know, that she was a, the coach of their daughters, you know, I felt so ashamed that I had the reaction of reading that she was their coach, and that I was so cynical about it. Mm. That I thought the description, you know, what I thought was a self description, was of being a coach was an overreach. 
you know, right. um, a, a, a cheering mother in the stands does not a coach make. Mm. Like that's the level of condescension that I had. Mm. And when I found out the truth, I was, was ashamed of myself. And, you know, I'm, I can't say enough about how, you know, I, 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 I live every day to, you know, you know, break down patriarchy. And yet I had that same, I had that reaction. I was so mad and so angry with myself. So then when I found that, you know, the truth of that, I said, you know what, this, this, this is a, this is, this is an historical correction that needs to be made. Because when you think about it, the reality is, is that Miss Orsine was, she was more Serena's coach than, than Venus's coach. Mm. And she designed the, their play. She trained herself to do that. She trained herself to do that in the middle of being a mother. She trained herself to do that. And so you have to think about that in the context of how tennis is played today. If someone says that the, the play of Venus and Serena has root revolutionized the game of tennis, then that goes directly to their mother, right? So their mother, Miss mm -hmm. Orsine, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? She, you can take that road straight to their mother. Right. right. And I felt that, you know, I, I, someone has hear, heard, if they hear it now, they've heard it probably mm -hmm. five times, you know, but I, I felt that I know that there are going to be so many more stories told about Miss about Venus and Serena because they are these, you know, large, you know, characters that tell us so much about humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how many times are we going to have a story, an opportunity to tell the story about their mother while she's alive? Right. So I wanted to speak for her, to her husband, and to the world. <laughs> You yeah. know, I know yeah. that sounds like, you know, no I don't, but I don't care. Yeah. Like, that's how, you know, that's what I wanted. That's what I came mm -hmm. to work to do. Mm -hmm. Speak for her because we ignored her. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we really do. And I feel like we ignore so many women in particular. Um, you know, I'm the product of a, a single mother myself. And I feel like seeing her, seeing your portrayal of Ms. Orsi on screen and then reading about her story to your point, just how much we diminish um, women um, and don't fully see them. It was really powerful. I saw that, that Ms. Orsi talked about your work and said that, um, and said, quote, that was me and that you did a great job um, portraying her, but also that to your point that she's, she said of herself that she's often quote quiet in the background that she doesn't, but when she speaks up, she says she, she doesn't play and she doesn't mess around. Yeah. Um, so that quiet power often um, that, that people like Ms. Orosine have, how do you think we can get to a place where, or a culture maybe where we do see more of these stories where we do see more of these voices, particularly of women or women of color who are often in the background and sort of not, not you know, um, jumping up and down saying the attention should be on me. I think it's, I think it takes, because we can't, I mean, there, I think, you know, a couple, couple things, the, the people who are in positions, because there are people who are in positions to change this, so let's let's be clear about that. There are people yeah. in positions to who can change this, mm -hmm. and they look like me. Right. They look like me. Mm -hmm. It's not just a bunch of white men. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They look like me. Mm -hmm. It's it's gay men who have those positions. Yeah. And who are still casting straight men to play gay men. Right. Perpetuating the same the same problem. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So why, why, why does this continue to happen? And I've, and I feel that, that, that it, it takes, it takes courage and it takes, it takes, cause I know all these same people will say things like, oh, we need to change the narrative and we need people to like, you know, we need pe more people in the positions. I'm like, okay, well now you are in the position. Mm. All right. Now you are in the position. And this is not about changing the narrative. This is about being honest and telling the truth. Because when you have a gay character 
that's being played by a by a a, a, a straight man and a vowed straight man. Right. It's yeah. it's it it moves beyond. And if you you say, well, okay, that's that's it's acting. Anybody? No, no, it's it's it, it's 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 performance. It's not acting. There's a difference, right? There is a difference, and I think especially when you're talking about underrepresented communities. I mean, Sean Penn has said that he wouldn't play Harvey Milk today. Like that, that wouldn't hopefully yes. hopefully wouldn't happen, right? I mean, there's so many. I mean, I know I can count so many gay actors on my hand who are looking for work and want to want to play anything, but also because they're underrepresented, to your point, often don't get the opportunity to just play, you know, play a gay actor and then not face the repercussions for being sort of in this box where they can't where they can't then do anything else, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, you look at someone like who, like Rock Hudson. Mm -hmm. right. You know what I mean? He's a yeah. gay man. He's a mm -hmm. gay man and um playing straight all the time right and and so you know he 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 was performing he was performing because he had to he had to right but now we 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 don't have to you know we can we can we can have you know spencer tracy says that acting is 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 behaving it's just behavior um, and if you have to put performance on top of that, that's not, it's not real. And I want, I want to experience something that mm. I know is is honest and and real as possible. Mm. So that that it's a it's a it's a practice that needs to stop. And what has to happen is when these straight actors get offered these roles, they have to say no. Mm. Right. It comes. It's a. It sort of comes cuts in in multiple directions yes. in terms of responsibility. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, the, McKinsey, the consulting firm, did a report on Black representation in the industry and found yeah, basically $10 billion worth of, um, of, of value of, of money that the industry could be earning. Um, but because of inequities for Black actors, Black executives coming up, folks behind the camera, there's still so many inequities to your point in the industry. So so I guess the question then becomes, like you said, if folks are in these positions who are from underrepresented communities and they're still perpetuating the mm -hmm. same systems of oppression, mm -hmm. what other changes would you like to see to really, you know, we've talked about as an industry inclusion writers, we've, we've talked about certain things. What other changes would you like to see, if any, in terms of either at the policy level or at the regulatory level to sort of start to really structurally shift some of these dynamics and who gets to tell these stories? Um, I, I don't know. I have a friend of mine who says mm. it should be a class action lawsuit. You mm. know what I mean? Like that, that because, you know, if we're still in this place, if we're still here and we are still here, like what, what will it take? I mean, I, I, I really pay attention to things like this. I'll give you an example of what I'm saying. Like, for example, if you go on Netflix right now, right? And, and think about the limited series that are on, the new limited series that are on Netflix right now. Mm -hmm. All of them, all of them feature and surround a story that is about a white woman. Mm. Yeah. That th these are the these are the series that that Netflix is is creating them. It's not something that's being imported. That this right. is it's this in house. Is, yeah. yeah creating yes. It. Yes. Yeah. Right. And and so why is that? Queen's Gambit, Made, uh, Inventing Anna. Right. You know. Yeah. All of them. All mm -hmm. of them focus white women. Mm -hmm. Not a not a black one. They, oh, there's black people in it as mm. the side chick. Side friend, <laughs> the best friend. The yep. best friend, and I know yep. you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. The best, the best friend, friend that disappears right? with the with the snarky comment or whatever. Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. That they're yeah. there for that purpose, mm. but none of them center mm. any. And not and it's not just black women. Yeah, you know? mm -hmm. none of them center. You know, um, you have the the exception of you know. Mindy Kaling with her with with her with her series and um 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 but that 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 generally is the rule yeah right. and and what does that say 
Mm -hmm. what yeah. Does what does it say? Yeah, I mean, especially amidst all the talk and you're in a season now with the award season, right? Where there is a lot of talk about we want to do better. We want, you know, we want to, we want to change the world, change the industry. And it's sort of like at the end of the day, I feel like a lot of times we're not looking at the cold hard numbers to your point like yeah, just count, just counting matter. and measuring and it's like it's not it's still not you're still not yeah good. yeah what's because we've been in this space for a couple years now mm -hmm. you know and and but where's the metrics are the metrics are the same like you can't have you can't say this we are this and we're about this and they have all those you know those bud buzzwords that i don't pay any attention to but I do pay attention to what's on my algorithm, yeah. <laughs> what's on my television screen. And they're not, I see the faces that are there. I see the imports mm -hmm. and I see what's generated by the company itself. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and here's the other thing. Here's the other thing with the exception of, um, you know, passing and, you know, our, yeah. our film, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think the film the film in industry is is it's, it's woeful, you know. Yeah. The television, the television, and there's so much, you know, because of streaming. It's that's it's very very blurred, but still, you know, the the film industry, um, you know, the big films that are produced, you know. Yeah, it it is still the 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 numbers. I mean, you're still looking at you know female directors in general. Still, a, you know, big budget films is is still a, you know a couple percentage points a year. You know, yeah, you're still. I mean, one of the most common things we see with the underrepresented talent we work with, like through the pipeline programs we start to, we we run or or support, is a lot of folks, especially with to your point with film, they don't even know where to start. Like, I feel like there's so much opaqueness in in that side of the industry mm -hmm. especially for people to your point earlier who don't come from money don't have resources don't have relationships their family yeah. wasn't in the industry right it seems like there's so many barriers still for folks there yes exposure you know but mm -hmm. you know i think i think that i think that um like i did this thing the other day I was talking to these kids from you know macomb my, where i'm from Mm -hmm. and um they were asking me all these questions and stuff you know about my life and I was like you know they were like what is it like to do blah 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 and I was like I want them to know what it's like right I want them to have that answer for themselves so I said okay y'all let's make a film let's make a movie let's make let's do it because we have the we have this you know the quality of it, who knows? But listen, I mean, right. people have done it for, for with far less. Right. So why not? Right. Why not? Why not? Yeah, we have now phones mm -hmm. in our pockets that we can yeah. really empower people. You you wrote this really powerful um, essay um, for Variety you, letter to kind of letter to to your daughters, um, where you said it's up to you to confront the isms and the the itties, the 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 things that still plague the creativity of Black women and beyond. Um, do you see that as a generational you know, part of this uh, as a generational solution that we need really the next generation to kind of lead the way in a lot of these things? Oh my God, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. You know, it's so funny. Like, I I was when I wrote that, I, I wrote it, you know, because I, I worked with these young women. Um, and uh, that's just some of my daughters. I got a whole lot more daughters, but those are some of my daughters of the mm -hmm. recent years. And I and I wrote it because I wanted I wanted it to be aspirational. I wanted them to see something that that I, I know is already there, but I wanted to encourage some things that may not be there yet. And one of those things is because we are in a in an in, in an industry that still very much favors the male experience, that male behavior particularly can look like the North Star. Right. We will we want to be accepted by the men. We want to be cool with the men. And what in, ends up happening is that you won't look at the women around you. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your, your level of respect, your level of, you know, and, 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 and not it just being a word that I respect you so much like that's an act. It's an act. 
Um, and, and, and that the idea of leadership being horizontal and not being, mm. not being vertical, you know, um, and, and I wanted them to know that they, that they can change that. Cause I hear, you know, I've hear these, I hear young women saying things like, you know, I have to play the game. And I say, girl, what game? Yeah. <laughs> what, what game are you talking about? You know, what, what game? She's like, yeah, Miss Anjanou, I got to play the game. I said, what, 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 what game? What are you talking about? Yeah. Are you, what? Cause right. that, that's the language, right? That's the language and all the things that happens and when you're playing the game. And I'm like, no, you come to work with the intention of doing a good job, knowing your lines, being present, being, you know, being present, professional, whatever, being present, being a good scene partner, everything else is bullshit. Right. Everything else is bullshit. And the bullshit is what you can change. And you can do that. You can do that. Hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. I mean, the idea of, of kind of, you know, um, celebrating your own power, knowing your own power, because you also said, you know, to, to folks coming up, like demand work environments that are safe and affirmed. Yes the man to be pay well, fight to be written for and about in a way that is a full measure for who you are um, and that you have some scars of your own, obviously along the way of doing that to, to back where we started that notion of fighting for yourself. Um, that has to be part of the way forward as well, doesn't it? You know, I don't have, I, didn't, I haven't had a choice and it doesn't make you the most popular girl at the lunchroom table. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, it sure doesn't. It, it sure doesn't. doesn't. It doesn't. But you have to, you have to, you have to do it anyway. But if if more if enough of us are doing it, then then it then it, it then it then it's something. It becomes something else. It becomes something mm -hmm. else. Yeah. My last question to you, Anjanira, on that note is, um, you know, King Richard has obviously made quite an impact. All of your other work has made incredible impact. I hope this moment that you're in career wise opens a lot of other opportunities for you and others to come what is your what is your hope um you know either for yourself and or um other underrepresented voices in the industry as we look to the next several years what, what is your hope and and desire in terms of where the industry should go on these issues of inclusion and equity mm -hmm. well i don't i don't what i don't have in terms of hope i have to activate hope I have to activate and I really don't think in terms of hope. Hmm. Um, um, I, I heard someone say really something really brilliant about this. You, when you, when hope puts, puts your, puts your fate in somebody else's hands and I'm badly, I'm badly par paraphrasing that, but what the, the way that I deal with the uncertainty of that and, and wanting something, wanting something to be not what it looks like on my screen screen for Netflix is 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 doing the writing myself and that's that's been my response to that is doing the writing myself and trying to build a community of people actively and actively doing that building a community of people who will you know do this with me and and trying to find people who are courageous courageous enough to to want to want to do it with me so that's 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 my response. And if if I'm if I'm doing it, that means I'm looking out for people who don't get to do it. Yeah. You know. Um, it was such yeah. a pleasure having you again, I guess today, uh, Anjani Ellis, Oscar nominated for a role in King Richard. Thank you so much, Anjani, for being on the, on the show and for all the work you're doing as well. Oh, thank you, thank you. Take care.